connected by purpose, driven by passion. This is Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank the following Keystone funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities. The Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation, BC Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital at London Health Sciences Centre, the Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. We would also like to thank the organizations that provide funding for our knowledge translation activities, which includes this Spark Live webinar series, the Spark Conversations blog, and the Knowledge Exchange Network. To learn more about Children's Healthcare Canada, you can go to our website, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, or you can sign up for our weekly Spark newsletter at childrenshealthcarecanada.ca slash email, where you will learn about upcoming events, read the latest posts from our blog, and other exciting news and events from across the child and youth healthcare community. Good morning. Uh, welcome to Children's Healthcare Canada's Child and Youth Mental Health Practice Network uh, webinar series. We're really glad that you could uh, take some time to join us today. Um, before we get started, uh, I'd like to go over a couple of housekeeping uh, items. Um, every, uh, all the lines are coming in muted, uh, and uh, if you have questions or comments, we invite you to um, type them into the question box uh, in the um, the uh, pane on this uh, side of your screen. Um, the session will be recorded and be posted on our Knowledge Exchange Network for viewing later. And again, um, we really encourage you just to type in your questions and your comments as you think of them. There's no, uh, no requirement to wait till the presentation is over. So today um, there will be three presenters and uh, We'll take questions at uh, the end of the three presentations. So right now I'm going to hand the mic over to um, the chair of our mental health practice network, Christina Barta. She's the executive director for the Brain and Mental Health Program at SickKids uh, Hospital. Thank you so much, Lisa, and welcome everybody to today's webinar series. Just by way of some context, the uh, Children's Healthcare Canada Mental Health Network uh, works to create a community of practice where we can share expertise, learnings, and ideas to advance our understanding of child and youth mental health and the many related issues that are so relevant to this field. There are um, a multitude of many important issues that we need to talk about in the context of child and youth mental health. But over the last three months, we have across the country been dealing with COVID-19 and the realities of a pandemic that for many of us as service providers and even people living in Canada has presented new challenges that we never had experienced before. And what we've learned in this past three months from coast to coast in managing the delivery of child and youth mental health services during a pandemic is very important in informing how we plan for the next three months and beyond that time. We are in a new normal right now in the delivery of services and in the many conversations I've had with different colleagues in Ontario and across the country, it's really clear to me that we can share and learn from each other to a very great extent and really optimize our success in being able to manage the effective delivery of our services in what is only, only can be described as an unprecedented set of circumstances. So today I'm really delighted to introduce four speakers from three different organizations across the country, and they will be presenting their own experiences of delivering services in, in the context of a pandemic. Um, and I'm gonna give a brief introduction of our four speakers. You can see their full bio in the materials that went out promoting today's event. And I will be moderating the discussion um, as the present, or uh, sorry, I'll be moderating the question and answer period after the presentation. So as Lisa said, do please feel free to enter your questions as we go through the presentations in the question box uh, on your screen. So I'd first like to introduce Sonia Sinclair, who is the director of the outpatient psychiatry department at BC Children's Hospital. 
Sonia has experience working in the mental health and substance use fields with adolescents, individuals in conflict zones, and individuals struggling with homelessness in the downtown east side, as well as adults with mental health issues involved with the criminal justice system. Dr. Jennifer Russell is a child and adolescent psychiatrist at, also at BC Children's Hospital and the clinical director of the COMPASS program. Dr. Russell has extensive experience treating youth with severe mental illness, including psychotic disorders, mood and, anxi mood and anxiety disorders, difficulties with affect dysregulation, and neurodevelopmental disorders. Aparna Kajintra is the manager of the Intensive Services for Youth at SickKids Centre for Community Mental Health. With over 12 years of experience in community mental health, mental health and philanthropic settings, Aparna has a passion for advocating and supporting youth to find success in their personal and professional journeys. Aparna works extensively with youth with significant mental health issues and operates from an anti-oppression framework and aims to service and address issues of equity, marginalization, and power in her role as the manager of these services. And finally, Maureen Brennan is the clinical director of the Mental Health and Addictions Program at the IWK Health Center. She has over 30 years of experience in the field of mental health and addictions, holding various clinical and administrative leadership roles across the healthcare system and in the community. And I'm really delighted that we have such a breadth of expertise on our panel this morning. And so we're gonna jump right in and I'm gonna hand it off to Maureen to begin with her presentation. It's over to you, Maureen. Good morning and thank you so much for uh, the opportunity to uh, share our experience with you. The IWK Mental Health and Addictions Program is, uh, is a program located in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia. And it is a health sciences center that provides care to a population of 2 million women, children, youth, and families across Nova Scotia, PEI, New Brunswick, as well as providing subspecialty care to residents of Newfoundland and Labrador. There are three programs at the IWK uh, Health Center, which include the women's, children, and mental health and addictions. The IWK is one of two health authorities in Nova Scotia. I wanted to give you a little snapshot of the uh, program of care. Uh, within the IWK, there's over 15 community mental health and addiction and forensic clinics throughout the Halifax area. We have uh, eight psychiatry-led specific care clinics at the health center providing specialized services across Nova Scotia. We have over 10 shared care and community partnerships providing collaborative care in those community organizations. We have four children's and adolescent day treatment services that support uh, people across the province. And we have several outreach services supporting uh, individuals and families across the province. And we have five provincial inpatient units and urgent and emergent services uh, located at our primary uh, health center. Wanted to give you a snapshot of the size uh, because the mental health and addiction uh, is structured in a continuum of services that is in a provincial tiered model of care and we're located in five different locations across Nova Scotia. We operate within a choice and partnership approach, which focuses on matching client needs to services. So essentially looking at having the right service in the right place, at the right time, and by the right person. We have over 430 staff and 16 child and adolescent psychiatrists in our service. Now, the focus of this presentation is going to be on the ambulatory services. So as you can see, this is pre-COVID uh, on March 18th, um, our services were bumping along with all kinds of exciting and innovative work happening. And then before we know it, uh, COVID came along and it essentially forced uh, many of our teams and our services to uh, go to a completely new uh, virtual platform. And uh, like many of you, you would certainly uh, have experienced this. And uh, uh, what we wanted to do is take you through some steps uh, to our pathway of virtual services in the ambulatory clinics. So we have several milestones along the way. And so a marker date for us was March 23rd. And essentially our co-leadership has made a decision to move all the ambulatory and intensive uh, services to a home-based office providing virtual services. Our central referral remained open throughout it all. All essential services uh, at the health center remain face-to-face -face and could also layer in virtual options. At the 26, we had telephone-based uh, and medio services for existing clients in mental health and addictions. 
and we started to look at the virtual practice uh, supportive documents and processes that were required to support staff. Uh, one identified challenge that we've had is uh, access <clears throat> for IT equipment for staff. And so working with our IT colleagues at the health center to uh, expedite that has been both a journey and uh, lots of opportunity for, uh, for uh, success as well. Uh, the IWK and the province of Nova Scotia adopted the platform Zoom for Healthcare, which allowed for video conferencing uh, throughout all services. In April 6, uh, what we've done is we were able to, uh, the program made a decision that um, in order to bring new patients into the service that we needed to have some ability to either see them face to face or to provide a video um, conferencing to actually see and assess and do the formulation. And so on April 6, when everyone had their equipment and, uh, and virtual platforms, we were able to bring new patients in and uh, all existing patients would continue to be, uh, to be seen. And uh, we started to recognize very quickly that uh, not all families had access to uh, IT equipment, computers, or the necessary uh, uh, electronic means to participate in virtual services. And so one of the opportunities that we did and uh, succeed on is creating a, an equipment loan program for all uh, families and children coming into our system that might not otherwise have the right electronic supports to participate in virtual services. And uh, continuing along the way, on the 14th, we started to have all our clinical groups. Um, we had several leadership groups that have been identified working and leading the way in creating the path for uh, how we can structure both clinical groups, um, so guidelines, processes to, uh, delivered uh, along the way. And, at, and also noted is lots of innovations and opportunity for research and evaluation so that uh, we can continue uh, learning from these experiences. So wanted to talk a little bit about the challenges along the way. Recognizing the massive practice change for staff and physicians working from home, the complications of childcare, perhaps inadequate to an office setup, isolation from teams and supportive colleagues have um, brought about challenges. Some populations uh, did need to be seen face to face, so creating flexible pathways and criteria to ensure that we're meeting clinical needs. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, readiness considerations, so virtual care, understanding if people have the right technology, perceptions, or understanding of how they can engage in virtual care. We recognize that uh, there have been many changes in goals and readiness due to COVID. So goals that might have been working on prior to COVID suddenly changed um, while COVID um, happened in a virtual world. So renegotiating that with uh, patients and families was another consideration. Uh, also, understanding that there are fewer, fewer visual cues, especially when you're only um, doing uh, visits on the phone. So recognizing the limitations there. Also flagged with uh, risks virtually, so suicidal uh, violence or substance use have been quite uh, challenging and wanting to make sure that we're able to best uh, meet their needs as well. All this massive amount of work needing to get done while service continued to operate. So a few highlights of ingredients for our success. Um, we quickly realized that we need to have a strong virtual practice leadership group to help advance the work to give the program focus as well as lead the practice change towards virtual services. This group has, has been an amazing group um, and certainly has been an anchor for a lot of the work to move forward. Uh, key themes would be genuine engagement of teams and staff, leveraging their expertise, uh, having a program-wide vision and approach, strengthening a collective virtual vision, a clear communication strategy, paying attention to the culture, ensuring we're building a continuous learning environment, patient and family-centered uh, care at the core of all that we do, uh, recognizing the impact of change and, and the practice change as well as their work location change, focus on team and staff uh, wellness, so lots of uh, activities and attention to supporting them, and mobilizing co-leadership across the program on all levels, as well as pulling upon the expertise of industrial engineer to integrate into all aspects of our work. A few pleasant surprises. Um, we talked about the equipment loan program, um, lots of opportunities for improved transitions across distance, um, great clinical supervision, uh, virtual clinical supervision progress made, um, 
we started to realize there are vulnerable, vulnerable populations we didn't think that would be engaging in services that suddenly uh, started to engage in virtual services when they might not have otherwise engaged in face-to-face. -face. We saw some interesting stats of the no-show rate in reproductive mental health participating in 100% virtual care. We successfully relocated over 250 staff and psychiatrists <clears throat> within a 48-hour period and <clears throat> lots of practice improvements uh, along the way. This is just an example of a, um, an innovation that um, we received a lot of feedback from staff that they felt um, was helpful. And it's really important to note that we have such amazing opportunities to leverage the expertise of staff. And so locating all the work, um, the flow, the flow maps, care, care paths, the templates, and uh, all those key informational pieces in a central place has really helped to uh, to structure the care. And this is the work of uh, the virtual practice leadership group with many uh, leadership uh, supports along the way. So this has um, been identified to be really supportive and helpful for staff as well. And for the IWK, key considerations for future services, really looking at the future state, um, we recognize virtual care is, is here to stay. And so the, the conversation and the planning is how do we embed, uh, embed virtual services into a continuum of mental health and addictions services, maintaining a focus on safe and appropriate uh, clinical intervention for clients and families, as well as supporting staff and physicians throughout the process. So we will be creating a mental health and addictions continuum services that does include flexible options for families to have face-to-face and or virtual services. And all along the way, we'll continue to evaluate and explore continuous quality improvement initiatives. So I'm going to pass it. And this is a, uh, this is the slide I want. Um, what we really capitalized in our process is the strength of the staff and the teams coming together and having diverse perspective and contributions to making this work. And we know if you wanna go uh, fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. Thank you. Thank you so much, Maureen. Um, we are going to move on now to Aparna. Aparna, are you there? Yes, I am. Thanks so much, Chris. So I'm going to be speaking today about the intensive interventions we have built virtually at the Sickett Center for Community Mental Health. So the Sick Kids Mental Health Program encompasses the Sick Kids Hospital, the Telemental Health Program, the Center for Community Mental Health, also known as CCMH, and the Sick Kids CCMH Learning Institute. I'll be focusing on CCMH today, which has two community sites in Toronto. Within CCMH, we have multiple clinical programs that support children and youth ages 0 to 18 and their families. And I'll be focusing on the intensive services for youth, which includes a date treatment program that integrates individual, family, and group therapy with academic support provided across four classrooms. The program also includes a residence. However, live-in treatment services have been paused due to the pandemic. So in the move to offering services virtually, the day treatment model has been gradually transitioned to a fully virtual program using the PHIPAA compliant version of Zoom for Healthcare. So prior to the pandemic, our day treatment model offered 27 and a half hours a week of clinical and academic support. When we rapidly transitioned to the virtual model, we established a target of providing 50% of our previous service offering. So this was based on taking the different clinical components we offered and replicating them virtually, along with establishing some virtual academic support. So we knew that the virtual program was gonna have to meet the needs of each youth and family where they were at. Our in-person program has quite rigorous expectations and it wasn't a fair standard to apply to families who were struggling to adjust to this new normal. So instead we focused on connecting with each youth and family regularly through phone coaching for the first two weeks as we developed our virtual programming schedule. This also allowed staff time to become comfortable with technology and practice with each other prior to using Zoom with clients. 
This also presented a perfect opportunity for us to be using co-design with our clients. So we consistently connected with youth and families to share what we were thinking about offering and whether they felt that this was in line with what their needs were. And as we rapidly prototyped our programs, we made sure to keep checking back in and make adjustments as needed. So for example, some families wanted more support initially and then felt comfortable saying as the weeks went on, I'd actually prefer to go back to one session a week rather than two. Academically, our child and youth care practitioners and teachers have worked closely together to provide remote learning to clients in the program. So youth have regular meetings with their teacher and CYC for academic support, as well as built-in times for group school sessions, which they can use to complete schoolwork or get additional academic support just the way that they would if they were in the classroom. As we have many youth that are transitioning out of our program, um, it was important to continue holding case conferences virtually and supporting those transitions. And an innovative example of how we were able to do this um, is having a group of clients accompanied by our CYCs to a virtual tour of an alternative school. Um, so some youth were nervous to attend the virtual tour by themselves. So the group met on Google Meet, and then one of the CYCs shared their screen of the virtual tour, which was happening live, so the youth could participate in the tour while still remaining together as a group and having the support of the staff. Finally, as a team, we've prioritized our commitment to continuous improvement and made a decision to use the virtual care model as an opportunity to increase our learning as a team. So we have a working group who sends articles to the team for review and facilitates discussions on a bi-weekly basis. And topics have included increasing support to youth struggling with substance abuse, best practices in providing care in a virtual context, and implementing anti-oppressive practices in our work. And these sessions have really built stronger relationships across our interdisciplinary team and deepened the commitment to embedding the knowledge we are gaining into our practice. So this slide shows an example of what one youth's personalized schedule for the week looks like. So all youth have an assigned phone coach who is available to them from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. each day. So this was implemented so that youth always had one person to reach out to if they were struggling and needed support. And what we've also found has worked well is establishing regular touch points during the week. So for some youth, this is a daily call at the same time each day. And for others, the support is once a week, which can be adjusted at any point based on what they need. Each youth and family is engaging in family and individual therapy on a weekly basis. And depending on the level of support needed for the youth, they're assigned regular psychiatry follow-up, which might be on a weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly basis. Our program uses a DBT-informed model, so we have two group therapy sessions per week, one which is focused on learning a specific DBT skill and the other on the practical application of that skill. So this group is staffed by two of our CYCs as well as our psychiatrists. We also have a weekly youth council, which acts both as a check-in to see how youth are doing, starting off their week, and also as an active component of our co-design, because this is when youth actually decide what type of programming is going to be offered in the social group on Thursday. So, of course, along the way, we have had many learnings and challenges as well. So I've spoken a lot about co-design and we really feel that this is something that has been essential to successful engagement in the program. Both youth and caregivers have had multiple opportunities to share what's been working for them as well as areas for improvement. Clinicians have come to learn that video therapy really requires a different level of facilitation where they may need to present themselves more enthusiastically or recreate a sense of closeness by leaning towards the screen, etc. For group work, this has meant that Staff need to have increased energy and organization on the part of everyone participating, as well as really having clear role. So knowing who is facilitating the group, who's managing the tech side, such as the chat function, and who would be supporting youth, accompanying them to a breakout room if they needed to take space from the group and have a private conversation. For our newest clients who joined just prior to or during the pandemic, we found that a directive approach in therapy has been really valuable um, as it gives them a clear focus. So this has looked like identifying goals with them and then using particular DBT skills and working on those skills so that they can achieve those goals. 
Finally, being flexible with how youth are choosing to engage has been paramount. I think there's an assumption that because so many youth seem to be glued to their phones that this automatically is going to translate into them being able to engage virtually successfully. Um, and that's not always the case. So being flexible for us has looked like for phone coaching, maybe having a live text conversation rather than speaking over the phone. And for others, maybe they will join our group on Zoom, but will only use the audio or chat function rather than fully engaging in the video platform. And so staff have accommodated this and we've worked as a team to support each youth in expanding their comfort zone as the weeks have gone by. In terms of challenges, the most obvious one is that we simply couldn't fully replicate our in-person day treatment model virtually. No youth can engage in that amount of a virtual care, and it's not a realistic expectation for clinicians to provide that either. The next piece was that even though we've had a lot of positive engagement, of course we've come across issues where some youth are interacting inappropriately during group sessions. So although we have made the expectations for group sessions clear and they've been outlined at different points, staff have had to become savvy in how they use Zoom if there is a disruption. So sometimes this might be a private chat conversation or it could be accompanying the youth to a separate breakout room where they can take space, discuss what's going on for them before rejoining the group. We've also found that for some youth who are struggling with specific mental health concerns, um, particularly those who are bipolar, experiencing psychosis or pre-psychosis, a completely virtual model is difficult for them to maintain engagement with. Um, there may also be difficulties in managing and monitoring medication, as well as less opportunity for intervention um, if things are escalating at home, which may or may not be managed differently if they were in the in-person clinical setting. And finally, even with the development of a schedule and structured offering, for some youth, just not being able to leave their house to engage in treatment is a barrier. We know that youth are struggling with their sleep hygiene and even with flexible hours, their motivation and capacity to maintain a daily schedule is just lower. And so through the weeks of programming, while we've seen some shifts and the consistency of supports has been crucial for that, we also recognize that a fully virtual program is not necessarily meeting the needs of all of the youth that we're supporting. So looking ahead, we will be reintroducing some in-person service that will meet physical distancing guidelines while still allowing for in-person connection and structure. We will be determining criteria to decide what levels of in-person service would be necessary for each of our clients. And our hope is to increase our weekly service provision to 18 to 20 hours in the mixed in-person and virtual model. So one way that we're planning on doing this is increasing our group therapy hours uh, in person to pre-pandemic levels as some of the groups were shortened in the virtual programming schedule to reflect the fact that it's difficult to remain engaged um, for that period of time online. We're also in the midst of developing criteria for in-person support for individual and family therapy sessions and some of the considerations that we're thinking about are sessions where interpreters are needed or where there are particularly complex relationship issues. We are going to be continuing to work with the Toronto District School Board to plan for the next school year, and our clinical staff will be supporting academics in the fall, whether this remains virtual, in person, or some blend of the two. And of course, supporting youth as they transition in and out of our program. We're gonna remain committed to our journey of quality improvement and work on updating our practices so that they embed equity and identity principles. So thank you everyone who has joined us today. Chris, I'll pass it back to you. Okay, thank you so much. And uh, I'm gonna hand it off now to our BC colleagues, Sonia and Jennifer, for their presentation. Hi everyone, um, I'm Sonia Sinclair. I'm the Operational Director here at BC Children's Hospital for the Ambulatory or Outpatient Care Programs. And Dr. Russell will also be joining me on this presentation in the next few minutes. Um, we would like to uh, just gratefully acknowledge our location here on the beautiful unceded Coast Salish territory um, and give thanks to the Musqueam, Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh Nations here in Vancouver as we get started um, on our presentation. So to give you uh, just a little bit of an overview, uh, here at BC Children's Hospital in our ambulatory or outpatient department, we have about 11 different subspecialty outpatient clinics 
clinics. Um, and as BC Children's Hospital, we have a mandate to serve the entire province of British Columbia. Um, and one of our key challenges in that work is that we have a very large geographical area um, and ourselves are located down in the tiny sort of southwest corner of the province, um, attempting to deliver service um, really quite broadly. And we as a, a service recognized that despite our provincial mandate, um, most, um, by far the large majority of patients who access our services were really located kind of within that sort of hour or two hour drive of us and so um, one of the initiatives we started about a year and a half ago to better uh, increase equity to access to child youth mental health and substance use services was this compass program and so really our compass program is about um, supporting community care providers to be able to deliver the best child youth mental health and substance use care closer to home and so how we accomplish that with the compass program is it is is a consultative service um, with uh, two physicians, pediatricians, and other community providers, so child and youth mental health and substance clinicians um, across the province. And really what we are trying to do is better equip them to be able to support the complex needs of children and youth up to the age of 25. And so we took um, a look really at um, the service delivery across the province and we wanted to ensure that we um, didn't just provide support to um, up to the age of 18 or 19 and sort of have the children abandoned uh, in that uh, drop-off stage of transition as they move into the adult system of care. So we made some key choices about um, the service being um, available to folks working with 0 to 20. What, um, what Compass actually is, it's a, it's a warm phone line. So there is a toll-free number um, that we uh, have up in operations Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. each day. And it is staffed by psychiatry, by psychologists, social worker, child and youth uh, mental health clinicians, um, and a resource coordinator. And so what that means is if you are a community provider in British Columbia working with children and youth up to the age of 25, you can call us um, at any time Monday to Friday and somebody will answer the phone. We actually pick up the phone immediately and you will have access to that multidisciplinary team. And so if the question that you are calling about is really sort of medication specific, um, you would be given access immediately to the psychiatrist on the team to discuss that through. If you are looking for some therapeutic interventions, you may go over to the mental health clinician or the psychologist. If you're really trying to figure out where's the best place to be supporting uh, the patient that you're working with in your community, we can connect you immediately to a resource coordinator who can help um, you navigate the services specific to your community and find that best fit. So there are some really sort of core tenets of the, of the COMPASS program in order to make uh, this work, and among them is really being able to establish those trusting relationships with providers in the community um, and letting them know that, I mean, essentially someone can call once about a patient or they can call 20 times about a patient. So COMPASS really sort of stays connected with that provider and their care throughout the journey that they're having with um, that patient. And so we may have somebody call us uh, one month and not hear from them again for another six months, but then they will call us back. Um, and there'll be a, a different presenting problem uh, with a particular child or youth, or they can call us about multiple children that are on their caseload. There's really sort of no end. Compass is very much a lean-in model um, of care. Um, we round out the service by attempting to provide um, training and education for providers as well. And so what we know is there's often been a gap in which um, somebody may attend a conference or they may attend a workshop, um, and they have a great knowledge base around that, but they never actually get to use that for an another year or so down the line, in which case they're not quite sure how to proceed. And so with Compass, there may be a training component, but we've always got the phone as the backup and you can call us and then we can coach you and walk you through or walk alongside you in your care. We also have um, a mechanism to provide direct patient care as needed because the program recognized how complex these children are. And really there are times in which we need to sort of be essentially face-to-face -face or laying eyes on a child to understand what's going on and help then uh, support that provider to continue care. So we don't ever take over care, we always transition that care back to the provider, but there are some mechanisms in which um, we will be doing direct patient care. And in those eventualities, um, that is usually done by a virtual platform. And so Compass, the, the Compass team had a, a breadth of experience in terms of delivering uh, virtual care, doing assessment diagnostics, um, treatment planning with children and youth across the province on a virtual platform. Um, the other tenant of Compass is that we will support what's going on in that community as identified by the community. And so our training and our education is always tailored to the needs that have been identified in any particular community. And so as COVID hit, 
we um, identified, in addition to all of the gamut of child abuse, mental health, and substance use concerns that were happening out there, is that providers had a really significant need to understand how they themselves could deliver virtual care to their patient population. And the um, other key piece is we really recognized um, the psychological toll and emotional toll that um, COVID was taking on providers in the community, particularly those working in isolation and needing support around that. And so under Dr. Russell's uh, leadership with the team, we, um, in addition to our regular services that we always provide, we sort of leaned in and started to really look at this virtual care issue and at the psychological wellness issue. And I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Russell to talk more about that. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, so one of the things uh, Asani mentioned is our focus as opposed to uh, patients or children and youth is really uh, supporting um, the community providers across BC that are taking care of these really complex um, children and youth. So um, we basically have done two things over the past three months to respond to the ever-changing needs um, here in BC. Um, the first was expanding our support and partnerships um, to provide peer support. Um, the first was with the First Nations Health Authority. With this model, um, we've been co-facilitating a weekly peer support group. Uh, we're co-facilitating it with a psychiatric nurse from the First Nations Health Authority. This is done um, through phone. Um, it's once a week, and this has enabled us to um, have a venue for uh, people who are working in very remote, um, and sometimes um, due to COVID, their communities have actually been uh, cut off physically from um, the rest of BC to contain COVID, um, to provide uh, peer support, increased uh, connection, as well as to build on uh, innovative strengths. So when one clinician comes up with um, an innovative idea, they're able to share that quite rapidly to, this. there's around 300 people that um, can join in on this call, and it's a very quick way to uh, disseminate uh, information. Um, this was chosen to be done via phone because many of the areas uh, remote BC don't have adequate Wi-Fi, even for the clinicians, uh, to participate via Zoom. And that's been um, extremely successful. Um, one of the things we've added to this is a period of mindfulness at the end of every call uh, for 10 minutes uh, where we go through a mindfulness exercise, really focusing on our own uh, mental health and skills at, to keep ourselves healthy during this time. Um, Compass is also paired with the physician, um, the BC Physician Health Program, um, where we've been offering uh, regular peer support to physicians um, this started at the end of March and through April, May was twice a week um, and was co-facilitated by the clinician lead at the Physician Health Program, Roxanne Joyce and myself, and is now being offered weekly um, as, as things have stabilized a bit. Um, we've actually had physicians from all over Canada and we even had a physician from the United States join um, this group uh, and in, we've had several pe repeat customers uh, especially older physicians um, that have been impacted uh, by COVID. Um, and through this, we've also been able to connect through Compass and had people calling the Compass line for support over individual cases. Um, the second um, area that, that we've done, which has been uh, really innovative and successful, is uh, as uh, IWK did that uh, excellent presentation earlier about changing um, from face-to-face -to, -face to virtual care, uh, this has been done also all over the province here, and many of the clinicians, um, especially in the north, were uh, not familiar with Zoom and hadn't done therapy online. So we were approached to offer um, a webinar uh, to support providers in making this transition. And so two of our clinicians, um, Darla and Chantal, who are really um, have extensive clinical experience, um, created um, a three-part webinar series, which I, I would entitle Beyond Zoom. So many of the workshops were really about how to work Zoom, um, but very there hadn't been a lot of material on how to actually leverage the Zoom technology uh, and make this clinical transition. So this webinar series was really focused on a trauma-informed practice and attachment lens with building on the clinical strengths that providers across BC already have 
and the strength of the therapeutic relationship as being seen as like the fundamental healing um, tool and started off with the sort of the nuts and bolts of working in a virtual way. Um, the second session uh, went into more specific patient populations, including how to do assessments and treatment with youth with psychotic disorders, uh, youth struggling with self-harm and suicide, uh, and neuropsychiatric, uh, specifically ADHD um, needs. And the final session, um, the people who had participated um, sent in cases, and we went into approaches uh, from a virtual angle on how to manage these cases um, in a slightly different way. We had a huge turnout with over 100 people attending the last two seminars, and uh, we're going to likely be doing it again, given um, the high demand. Sonia, I think that's is that it for the next slide? Or? Yeah. So we have, oh, so just in terms of some upcoming challenges, um, like the other two presenters said, we've had definitely some wins with virtual care and unintended consequences. Um, there's been, specifically with families um, that are sometimes harder to reach, we've actually been able to reach them more in their home, very similar to what happened with IWK. Um, however, we've noticed a significant um, increase in, in children with our neuropsychiatric uh, population in BC as the school system shut down and many um, of the MCFD respite resources shut down due to COVID. Uh, so that's something our team is currently working on. Um, also noticing concerns of youth that are, uh, their substance use has rapidly increased given um, the amount of free time and lack of structure. Um, we're preparing uh, for the anticipated anxiety uh, for kids that have been out of school for several months in September. Um, issues around screen time de dependence and uh, the avoidance of, of actual functioning, especially in families with inadequate childcare who've been coping during um, COVID with both parents working. And there's also been some concerns about increase of domestic violence, given the increased pressures on families uh, and how this has impacted youth mental health. And I think that's, that's, uh, that's it. At Compass, uh, one thing we just want to stress is we're here and we're in it together. Um, our goal is to work collaboratively with um, all the providers that call. Um, and, uh, and that's it. Sonia, did you have anything to add? No, I think you covered it all off. Thanks so much. We will turn it back over. Okay, well, thank you both for um, such an informative presentation. And thank you to all of our speakers who gave us a coast to coast perspective on the work that's been underway in such a such a short period of time while we've been responding uh, within the context of the pandemic. So for all of the people who are on our webinar, we um, now invite you to um, type in any questions you might have in the question and answer box. And um, somebody is asking, they, they lost the connection. Are we having any connectivity issues, Lisa, for any of our participants that we just need to double check on? I um, haven't had any other indication of that. Okay, so if um, any of you have lost your connection, um, please do try to exit and come back into the call and hopefully you'll reconnect with us on the webinar. Um, I oh okay looks like the person's back so that's good. Uh, so let me, <laughs> this is what um, uh, live radio feels like. So I'm yeah. going to get started with the uh, with the, the questions that are coming in. So a really great one at the top of the question box relates to a conversation that actually Aparna and I were part of earlier today, which is. Um, just the phenomenon of having over time the possible drop off of client engagement, whether there's any Zoom or virtual fatigue with some of our clients and the challenges of maintaining engagement with a subset of our clients in the virtual environment. And I'll just open that up to um, maybe Maureen and Aparna could comment on that because you're very closely related to direct service with clients. Sure, I can speak to that. that. That has been identified, and so that's where there's been a lot of opportunities and innovation of the teams and uh, looking at uh, creative ways. So an example would be uh, creative ways to engage through video uh, in, and um, allowing uh, the introduction of attack um, games or sessions to 
develop a relationship. Um, there was a recognition that we needed to have with certain populations face-to-face um, -face options, and so we did introduce that and, uh, and looking at various ways creatively to engage the parents, to engage the youth, and, um, and looking at both the home structure to, to set them up for success, as well as unique ways to engage children and adolescents differently. So um, the teams have done various um, activities to do that, and we can share more later if you like. Great, thanks. Aparna, do you have any thoughts that you wanna share? I think Maureen covered it all. I certainly think that we've seen that drop off as well and having options for in-person care is certainly going to be important. I think one of the other things um, that we found as well is even with families who do have access to technology and are able to engage um, via phones or computers or things like that, um, there is an equity piece there. And the other piece that's related to that is the privacy and, and the comfort of you, particularly if there are many people or families, if there are many people at home feeling like they can genuinely be open and share how they're feeling without being overheard or monitored, I think is definitely a concern in a way that wasn't when they are there in person in a separate space. And I would just add a piece that um, understanding what's behind um, the, the sort of the energy of not wanting to engage. And so we set up standard work around advanced call and prep to understand if there's any challenges, concerns, and creating solutions so that we can set it up for success. And we found that um, more often than not, that has resolved um, a lot of uncertainty and, and help with engagement. So that's been super helpful, the prep work. Okay. Um, so we're going to take a bit of a different direction. There's um, been a few questions about supporting clinicians and clinician work from home models. So um, this has also been something as time has progressed and we march past the eight week uh, point in time with work from home and virtual care. We do have some challenges for our, our employees, actually our clinicians who are working from home with children at home because school is not um, formally running right now and also partners may be working from home as well and how we are supporting our clinicians to successfully navigate all that while they're trying to deliver services from home online. Um, and I, I'm gonna open it up to the group for uh, any thoughts about how in your different organizations you've tried to address this as a logistical challenge. I could speak to that. Um, it's Jen here from BC. Um, is that okay? Yes, of course, yeah. Okay, all right. So Compass has actually been, we've had remote employees since our inception in September. And so for the last, I guess, as Sonia said, it, we're almost at two years, um, have been working on how do we keep um, remote employees engaged. So some of our team are actually not even living in Vancouver. Um, so what our team did is we've set up daily huddles. Um, we have one at 9.30 in the morning and one at four o'clock. And the goal of these huddles is to review what's happened clinically during the day. So it's a chance to for team members to bring up difficult cases or just express like how we're feeling in general. Um, and in the morning, the huddle is really about planning for the day, making sure um, that as a team we're collaborating and problem solving anything that comes up. And I have to say that it's been really amazing. Um, I'm in that situation. I, I'm now at home. Um, my husband is at home. We have two kids that are not in school. Um, and having, so I, I personally moved from the hospital, which I loved working. I love, love our team. So it's been a really a big challenge for me personally. Having those huddles has really been a chance for us as a team to connect. Um, we've been able to talk about the clinical work, but also our own personal experiences of how it's been going through COVID. Um, it's been, the discussions are extremely supportive, um, very clinically driven, and has really been a chance of like innovation. And uh, you know, really, I, I have to say, it's probably the best thing that our, our team is doing. And, our team has reflected on this, um, and I, I think they would all um, agree with, with this statement. And so even though it is, a, you know, a big time commitment, 
Um, you know, it's like, and sometimes the huddles are very short, five or 10 minutes if there's nothing. But if something has happened or there's something clinical, we do have that time um, set protected in our calendars. That has really helped with, you know, compassion fatigue, burnout, overall stress, and then just team cohesion. So that's just one idea that we've been doing on Compass. Thank you. That's that's uh, really helpful and important to understand how Compass has approached that. Um, I'll just make a comment uh, from the Sick Kids Hospital, Sick Kids CCMH perspective. Um, this has been a challenge both in the hospital and the community that uh, employees' personal and professional lives have somewhat collided in the home as they've been pivoting to accommodate virtual service delivery, so a lot of guidance documents and similarly support has been provided. I do think it's particularly challenging for some of our staff who may have many uh, uh, elderly family living with them or very young children and no child care, and so hours of work become really challenging to be able to adhere to in the traditional sense. So. We've tried to be flexible, but this is going to be an ongoing challenge into the foreseeable future, uh, working flexibly with each staff and employee to figure out what's possible within the constraints of their own personal circumstances. And I'll open it up to the rest of the panel to see if there's any further comments on this. Uh, yeah, it's certainly been a focus of concern for uh, the IWK, and we've received a lot of feedback uh, from our staff about that. So very similar to much of um, what was said, I'll, I'll layer in the focus on wellness. And so we've had a very specific um, trauma-informed care leadership group and partnering up with HR and physician leadership around a wellness hub that offers uh, flexible uh, ways to support. So there's a virtual wellness site as well as a comfort for those that are working um, at the main health center. So kind of options to provide that level of support. And examples um, might be flexible schedules um, and so that we're allowing some degree of autonomy for people to work things out in a way that makes sense for them. Uh, we created a peer support line so that um, specific to this pandemic so that there's uh, physician and staff support um, that uh, might be helpful. We also spend a lot of time understanding the importance of um, the impact of isolation, um, both from our colleagues and from uh, the structure and support our worksite gives. So a lot of our clinical leadership focusing on the concept of strong teams and how we create um, similar to daily huddles, so all the teams having team meetings. The other key, uh, key piece that we've heard a lot about and, and we put a lot of energy in creating a communication strategy that has very clear, transparent communication from a program-wide level, as well as the various levels of leadership across our program. So that's been um, identified as, as helpful. And Mindful Monday, so we do mindfulness, and, and so we uh, do that every Monday at, at specific times, so building in ways to support and ground people so that they have a few options that might be of help to them. The other last piece would be there's a lot of roads leading to leadership and so making sure we support our leaders and that we're creating avenues of wellness and support for them as well. Thanks. Okay. I'm going to try to squeeze in a few more questions because always there's a, a big rush of questions that come in in the last um, 10 minutes of these webinars. So really a, a practical question. How did you all manage equipment for your staff working from home? And I, I will um, say that uh, this has this was just a massive challenge for us at Sick Kids. And uh, Aparna, you might want to talk about just the very practical approach we took. Sure. So um, within each team, on the day on March 16th, when we decided that uh, we would be shutting down in-person services, each clinical manager and all of the managers actually sat down with their teams and figured out, okay, who has technology at home that they can use, who has internet access, who doesn't, because unfortunately, um, we don't have uh, corporate laptops for all of our staff. So we really did sort of need to ration them out and figure out who needed them um, immediately. And so that's what we did initially. And over time, we have had to purchase additional technology or support staff with um, getting access to internet or things like that. Particularly, um, I think even with using technology, even for, for staff who maybe initially had something, um, I think the amount of use that all of us 
have exerted on our devices uh, is taking a toll as this goes on as well. Yeah, so it's an ongoing challenge. Maureen, what, what did you do in Nova Scotia? I have to say, I have to give kudos to uh, the IWK IT uh, because we've made um, amazing uh, things happen in light of COVID. So we actually had people and permission for desktops um, to ensure encryption and they were able to take their desktops home and set up home offices as well as getting um, uh, global protect to give access to information and then that was quite a journey but um, but amazing that uh, everyone has their actual desktops home and we have a um, a a process in place where we're trying to um, start to build on our, our laptops and our other infrastructure but um, that was quite amazing we didn't think that was going to happen but but it did and it's working fine Okay. And any news from BC on this? Has this been a challenge for either yourselves or for um, your partners? Well, I, I can speak at Sonia. I can speak from sort of children's at large because, as I said, our um, our outpatient department um, did also begin to offer virtual care and have some um, clinicians um, also start to work from home. Um, and the approach here really had been to rely on individuals' own uh, personal devices. We, we were not and have not been in a position to sort of fund or purchase, um, uh, in, you know, PHSA uh, devices for people to take home. So it is a bit of a, a, a hodgepodge in terms terms of um, what people have um, in terms of internet connections and all of those pieces um, also ended up relying on some waivers that came through and I'm not sure if it happened in other areas of the country but in terms of some of the uh, internet providers um, and cell phone providers agreeing to sort of waive uh, data charges uh, for uh, healthcare providers in order to access things so um, there really wasn't or we were not in a place to have a more sort of formal supported approach to that um, but we were able um, to leverage you know the clinicians existing devices. Okay thank you. Two last questions to squeeze in. Um, Jennifer and Sonia, is Compass a one of the one of a kind type of program? Are there any other programs like yours uh, nationally or internationally? Do you know? So Compass um, was modeled after some um, a, a really uh, successful programs in the United States. Uh, McPap out of uh, Massachusetts, which is I believe the what do they stand for? The Child um, uh, and McPap. MCPAP, um, Psychiatric Access Program. Um, so there are currently about 20 like programs in the United States operating with various funding models, various hours, various um, approaches, but this sort of the fundamental premise being the same thing about um, trying to improve capacity around essentially primary care or community child and youth mental health clinicians to be able to deliver that care closer to home. We are the only one uh, in Canada. Um, there has been uh, interest from various jurisdictions across Canada interested in um, either developing a model or accessing our services. So we also provide service to the Yukon Territory. I should um, say it's uh, BC and the Yukon Territory. Um, and we are more than willing to uh, uh, talk to anybody about this model because it is, um, it's proven to be highly effective. But at this point, we are the only one in Canada um, and we are based upon some uh, successful models in the United States. Okay, that's great. Thank you. Oh, can, can I add one more thing, Marie? The other thing is that the programs in the states are, 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 are all either mental health or substance use. So I think we're the only program that I know of that does both. Oh, okay. That's uh, excellent. Thank you so much for that. And last question to squeeze in. Um, is anybody doing any formal evaluation of the youth experience uh, receiving services virtually? For us here at BC Children's, that is sort of one of the next steps um, for those that have been a um, direct service patient care um, attached to our outpatient department, but we haven't completed or actually initiated that at this point in time. Hmm. So we might have a national project that's possible. Yeah. With us, we're all doing this, yeah. Um, we, we did create the, uh, the framework and we're beginning to implement um, that. And uh, there's a piece of the research, uh, piece of the research that we were successful in getting. So that uh, that's certainly underway. Right. Um, we just have a, a two minutes left. So I, I want to thank you all for taking the time to share with us what your journey and, and experience has been over the last uh, weeks and months as we go through this unprecedented time in Canada and globally with COVID-19. I know that we're all um, planning and anticipating how we're going to resume 
um, some in-person services in some of our environments and also how we're gonna be really flexible and nimble should there be a second wave of COVID-19 uh, or even not a major wave, but maybe it's combined with a serious influenza season that does create a lot of demand on our services in the hospital, but also the um, ongoing conversation that's been uh, underway around whether we're going to see a big bump up in um, uh, service demand in the fall as hopefully school starts to ramp up, but also that uh, children become more engaged in some of the uh, activities we have through school and recreation, and, and we may have uh, more presentation of uh, mental health issues. And also, I'll add, um, here in Ontario, Child Welfare, who's a big partner with Children's Mental Health, has also been impacted by the pandemic, and there is a concern that perhaps we're not picking up on all of the children and youth that should be identified as at risk. So as they become more active and able to engage in in-person services, we may see an increase in demand in that area as well. So we're all dealing across the country with similar challenges. And I think there is an enormous amount to learn from each other today, but also in the foreseeable future as we all try to manage similar challenges across the country. So this is just a beginning, and uh, I really do appreciate the opportunity to have heard from all of you about your local experiences. And, um, and I hope we actually can stay connected through our network so that we continue to share our uh, both good, uh, good experiences and where there's been some hard learnings that we really do need to share with each other so that we don't replicate those across the country and we have the advantage of each other's experience to inform our planning. So with that, it is now 12 o'clock. I want to thank everybody for joining us on the webinar and thank our speakers for some uh, wonderful presentations today. And um, I want to wish all of our audience uh, to have a great day. And I hope you'll join us again for another uh, webinar on our mental health network. And we'll be promoting those in uh, future communications. So thank you all and bye for now. <laughs>